Micro frontends are an architecture pattern for your JavaScript that's in the browser. It's a fancy term that means microservices, but inside of a browser. I'm the original author of the most popular micro frontends framework on GitHub called SingleSpa. And I currently maintain SingleSpa along with a core team of four others. We've been doing micro frontends for about five years now. In this video, I'm going to go over what are the objectives of the micro frontends architecture? What is a micro frontend conceptually? And what is a micro frontend technically? The screen that you're looking at here is a teaser for, for what's to come. Each one of these billing UI and primary nav bar are separate micro frontends along with this big list of all these micro frontends. First though, let's talk about objectives. Micro frontends is an architecture that has pros and cons. Here are three things that the micro frontends architecture is trying to solve. First is incremental migrations and incremental rewrites. Migrations and rewrites are an extremely costly part of being a frontend code base. Migrating from Angular 1 to React or Angular 1 to Angular 2 or 4 or 8 or 9 or even migrating within a framework. React 16 to 17, Angular 6 to Angular 8, Vue 2 to Vue 3. All of those can be really uh, time consuming and costly to an organization. They are not as simple as just NPM install. You sometimes end up having to rewrite the entire thing <laughs> just to get there. So with micro frontends, you split your code base up into micro frontends such that you can rewrite any one of those micro frontends with exactly zero changes to any other micro frontend. So the blast zone or blast radius of having to do a rewrite is always just, well, the one micro frontend. This can really save you time and your organization time as you're trying to make technical progress and migrate from one technology to another, while also continuing to make progress on the product. Okay, number two here, independent release schedule. When you have 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 developers, if you only have one build and one deployment for all of your front-end code, that can become quite painful. You end up doing long QA regression cycles with code freezes just to be sure that you're not going to break anything when you press that big deploy button and release it to production and to your users. With micro frontends, you make each of your micro frontends independently deployable and owned by a team. So this now means that the teams can control when do I want to release our big new feature? When do I want to release that small bug fix? The developers and the teams now have the power to deploy their own code, which means that you can deploy to production far more frequently. Third one here is technical decisions. <clears throat> so when you're in an organization, often there is a senior developer or group of developers or architect that make some or all of the upfront decisions about how your code is going to be. Are we going to use React? Are we going to use Vue or Angular? Are we going to use SAS less or CSS or CSS and JS? Are we going to use Moment.js or Day.js or Time Ago JS? How do we, are we going to use Yarn or NPM? How do we propose a change to any of those decisions? All of those, when you only have one project with one build and deploy, all of those decisions are often pushed up to the very top of the organization. The architect makes all or almost all of those decisions. And the reason why is because it's difficult to allow developers to make their own decisions when there's only one package JSON, there's only one webpack config and there's only one deploy button. So with micro frontends, you 
at least allow some of those decisions to be pushed down in your organization, pushed down to the individual developers and teams who are working on those projects. So maybe some decisions are still made at the top level, like we do view, but some of the other decisions, such as we do TypeScript on this project, or and we don't do TypeScript on this project, or we do SAS but here, but we don't do SAS here. Maybe some of those decisions really should and can be pushed down. Microfrontends makes this possible by giving each microfrontend its own build process, its own tooling, its own webpack config, etc. Okay, so that's objectives here of microfrontends. Let's transition now into what is a micro front end conceptually. So a micro front end conceptually is what you're looking at here on the screen where you've split up the page visually into chunks of UI. Okay, so we've got primary nav bar, which is owned by the blue team. We've got billing UI, which is owned by the gold team. As we navigate around, Notice, look here over on the right as well, and you'll notice that some things come in and out of being mounted or not. As we navigate around, more micro front ends are mounted, other ones are unmounted, and there are different teams that are owning those. So in this way, micro front ends look a lot like components, right? We, I have this fancy overlay that shows, you know, the name of it and who owns it, but really, doesn't this just look like a component? And yes, micro front ends and components are pretty similar. One big difference, though, is that with micro front ends, they are independently deployable. They do have their own build process. They have their own Git repo. They have their own package JSON. Uh, with components, even if you're using code splits, often they are not independently deployable. They are not built separately. They do not have their own CI process. Let me illustrate this by showing the CI process for one organization's micro front ends. So here we are, this is using Circle CI. There are seven micro front ends here on the left. Each of these micro front ends has its own CI pipelines, workflows, jobs. And you can see as we navigate around, let me click into one of these workflows. You'll see that here I am on the navbar micro front end. It has its own npm install, its own npm test, its own npm run build with webpack, and its own deployment. When you deploy navbar, you are only deploying the code within that navbar GitHub repo. You are not deploying any other code. Okay, so that's what a micro front end is conceptually. Let's end now with what is a micro front end technically. And getting into the technical details here is actually a bit tricky because there are many ways to do it. In this video, I'm going to show you the single spa way of doing it. But just keep in mind that other organizations and developers have come up with their own ways of doing micro front ends. This video, though, will focus on the single spa core team's recommended setup and what that entails. So take a look here. Here's a list of all of the micro front ends. So with the single spot recommended setup, each micro front end is one in browser JavaScript module. And so you'll notice here in the network tab, we're downloading root config. Here is root config over here. So this is the list of in-browser modules. We're seeing in the network tab, here we go, we're downloading root config. Style guide, we're downloading, there it is, style guide. Primary navigation, patient chart. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between a micro front end and a in-browser JavaScript module. Within the context of single spa, there are three kinds of micro front ends. There are single spa applications, single spa parcels, and then helper modules. This video won't be able to go into each one of those in detail, 
but I'll give a brief overview right now to wrap up. So a single spa application is a chunk of UI that is in charge of a URL route or routes. So login is a great example of a single spa application. It is in charge of this route, OpenMRS spa login, and it's a chunk of UI. Another kind of micro front end in single spa is a single spa parcel. So a single spa parcel is a chunk of UI that is not in charge of any URL routes. The third kind of micro front end within single spa is a helper module. So a helper module is not a chunk of UI. It is not UI components. It is a in-browser JavaScript module that is just JavaScript code. It's not creating DOM elements. There's no React or Vue or Angular going on inside of it. Um, it is just a JavaScript module that helps you do something. So a good example of that one is ESM error handling here. Error handling exports some functions that will help you capture errors, report them to the user, and report them to the server successfully. ESM API is another example of an in-browser JavaScript module. This is one that will help you with authentication, authorization, permissioning, and just communication making API requests to the server. Those kinds of helper modules are really important. They are, mic they are micro front ends. However, they are not UI you know, based. They're, they don't have UI components inside of them. Okay, so to review, there are three kinds of micro front ends within single spa. All three kinds, all of them are always a one-to-one -one mapping between a micro front end and an in-browser JavaScript module. The three kinds are single spa applications, which control routes, single spa parcels, which are UI components that don't control routes, and then helper modules, which are in-browser modules that don't do UI at all. They just export functions that are like utility functions for all of the other micro front ends. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, this video is part of a series of videos that I'm doing. There's a playlist on YouTube that shows them. The series of videos is meant to introduce single spa and also get into some more of the details of how do you get this going. So if you're interested in learning more about this architecture or single spa, please check out those other videos. 